Welcome to Where Parents Talk. My name is Leanne Castellino. Our guest today is a holistic health practitioner and speaker. Elaine Uskowski is also an author of two books about gaming addiction, a parenting educator, and a mother of two. She joins us today from Guelph, Ontario. Elaine, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Leanne. It's a pleasure. I wanted to dive right into your story by asking you, what do you wish that you'd known before uh, your son spiraled into his gaming addiction? Yeah, that's such a great question because, you know, that was back in 2014 and there really wasn't anyone talking about video gaming addiction in my circle. So first, I wish I'd known it even existed. I would have known what I was looking for. I knew something was wrong. Uh, I just couldn't put a finger on it. I knew it wasn't drugs. I knew it wasn't alcohol. I just, I knew there was something going on with my son. Uh, so yeah, I wished I'd, I'd known that it even existed. Um, but apart from that, I wished I had an understanding of how important regulating gaming was as he was growing up as a child. I think he had too much gaming. Uh, I mean, he did well in school and had great marks and he was involved in sports and had lots of friends. So he looked like a well-balanced, stable kid. Uh, but I think in the long run, he, I allowed him to game just too much. So what did that look like in terms of hours and looking back on it now after everything that you've all been through, how would you have restructured it or changed it? Uh, I would say in, when he was in his teens, he started to game more. Um, he also started to talk about uh, kids I'd never heard of. And I'd ask him, who are you talking about? And he'd say, it's somebody I met online gaming. Um, and so for me, it was important to talk to him about privacy and not giving out personal information, those sorts of things, keeping him safe online. Uh, but as long as he was still seeing his tangible friends, I wasn't too worried. Um, he had, you know, uh, during the middle school years pulled away from, from some of that. Um, but, but he bounced back in high school and, and made some good friends there. And so, uh, yeah, it looked, it looked okay in those regards, but I did notice then he was having difficulty getting up in the morning and getting to school. Uh, by grade 12, his mark started to slide. Um, and, uh, you know, he still got marks to get into university. So he, he somehow slid under the radar. Um, it wasn't until he got into university that things started to really fall apart. And I noticed bigger signs. And the, the summer between first and second year of university, he was gaming a lot. So he was working only part time. He was a dishwasher in a restaurant. So he was working late at night. And then he'd come home and, and continue to game. Uh, sometimes it would wake me up and I'd have to ask him to stop. Um, and then, you know, he'd be sleeping through the day. And when I did approach him to say, I think you need to get another job, you're gaming a lot. Uh, he got very angry with me and, and, uh, and, and yelled, this is my last summer free. After this, I'm either gonna be in co-op or I'm going to be in school. Uh, and I just want one last summer. And of course I relented and I wished I hadn't. Uh, because in second year, first semester, things really got bad. And I, I hardly heard from him. If he was answering my texts, it'd be three o'clock in the morning. So I, I wondered if he was even going to classes. Uh, the odd time I saw him, his hair was very greasy. He had a smell. He wasn't taking care of his dental hygiene. And he was wearing braces at the time. Um, and he started, he looked like he was starting to lose weight. He was very shaky all the time. Um, of course, every time I asked him questions, he had very justifiable answers. You know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm finding it hard at school, uh, it's more work. I don't have time for showers. I, yes, I'll, I'll eat more, but I don't, don't really have time. Um, so he was able to hide it really well. You know, it's interesting because there's so much in there to unpack. So he's not living under your roof. So you're not seeing this firsthand. When you do see it, it it's troubling to you. He is right. an adult for all intents and purposes. So what is, you know, what is your involvement as his mother? What can it be? What can it look like? So let right. me ask you, Elaine, um, you know, at what point did you say to yourself, you know, this is rock bottom and we need to intervene? And what did that look like? I would say probably a few days to a week uh, prior to me hearing from him, 
I said to him in a text, are you even attending classes? You appear to be a bit of a night hawk. You're answering me at three in the morning. And again, he said he was up uh, and um, doing an assignment. And in my gut, I thought, I think I, I need to really be watching this closer. Something's really wrong. And then I received on October 31st, 2014, an email from him. And he wasn't coming clean and saying that he was a gaming addict. Uh, but he had not attended classes for two months and the university caught up with him and said, you know, you can't live in residence. You're not a, re a registered student. He'd been deregistered. He'd missed the payment. He made it late. So he'd been deregistered from classes as well. Hadn't told us. And uh, he was told that the locks would be changed and um, he'd have to find another place to live. He had three days. So he was calling because he was sort of trapped in a corner. Um, and, you know, I, picked up the phone immediately because he was so distraught in the email and said, what do you need? And he burst into tears and said, I, I need you to tell me this is all going to be OK. I said, we'll make it OK. I, I didn't know what that was going to look like, uh, but I knew he needed me in that moment. Uh, so I drove to the university. And I was so afraid during that drive that that I would get there and find that he'd taken his life because he just sounded so fragile. So it was a very scary, long drive. And when he opened the door, boy, did I open my eyes. He is six foot two. He was 19 at the time, and he had dropped to 127 pounds. He had facial tics, tremors. His hair was greasy. He smelled horrific. He looked like he'd been wearing the same clothes for days. His complexion, which was normally squeaky clean, was just a mess of acne. I didn't even recognize him. He was just a, a sack of bones. Um, and that's when I started to realize this is way bigger than, uh, you know, he's just struggling with school and started to remember what happened in the summer and thought, I think he's got an addiction because he did say uh, that he was up all night, up to 16 hours gaming until he would pass out and then he would sleep all day. That's how he was filling his time instead of going to class, full of anxiety, didn't know what to do because he was an adult, felt he needed to figure this out. And the more time that went that he couldn't figure it out, the more he panicked and the more he gamed. So to me, that looked like an addiction issue. Uh, so I brought him home and uh, we had a long talk. I really approached it with as much empathy as I could because I knew this isn't what he wanted. I knew he wanted to make me proud like any kid wants to make their parent proud. He wasn't choosing this. Uh, and I made him detox from the gaming completely initially. I took him to the doctors to get him a health check. Um, he was diagnosed with severe anxiety and depression. And I started to get him on a healthy eating plan, get him back to daytime, nighttime sleeping that was normal. And I took him to my uh, fitness classes in the morning, hoping that some exercise would, uh, the dopamine from the exercise would replace some of the gaming uh, dopamine, but also elevate his mood. Uh, and I watched him 24 seven on suicide watch because I didn't know what was going to happen at this point. I didn't know how he would react to losing the gaming on top of you know being so depressed and anxious and the doctor was able to get him to see a therapist uh, for eight weeks it wasn't an addiction specific therapist he wasn't familiar with gaming addiction and so of course jake manipulated him and and had him believe that he didn't have an addiction they actually together came up with a plan so that he could schedule gaming time in when he returned to university in second semester, which I was not on board with whatsoever. But of course he was an adult and I couldn't control what he was doing when he got to university. So he returned second semester to pick up the three courses that he had failed in first semester. We learned that when he was home, it wasn't the success he said it was. Um, and within a week, I got that bad gut feeling again. And this time I went back to the university to check on him and he came to the door and I could see he had relapsed immediately. Mm -hmm. And he believed with eight weeks of counseling under his belt that he could play for an hour. So he loaded the game on the Sunday night when we dropped him off and thinking he could only play for an hour and he played all night and he didn't go to classes for another week again.
So I brought him home again and we talked about what he thought the issues might be, the emotional issues, the struggles he had with school, the, the lack of confidence he had in himself. Um, and I asked him again, you know, sky is the limit. What do you need? Do you want to go to university? Do you want to do a, something else? Do you want a gap year? Do you, we can change this plan. This isn't what you have to do. And he said, no, I, I want to get my university degree. And um, I said, so then what do you need from me? And he said, I need you to drive me to school and walk me to classes until I can do it on my own. If you send me back on my own. I can't trust myself not to game. So he had the insight to realize he needed help. And uh, I, you know, was so proud of him to be 19 years old, asking his mother mm -hmm. to drive him to school and walk him to class. And, and so that's what I did. I put my business on hold and, I, and that's exactly what I did and, until he could manage on his own. And then once he was felt he could get into classes and stay in residence through the week. He was required to take a picture of himself in every lecture um, and send it to me by email. So he'd have accountability and he had to come home on the weekends. And that, that went on for two and a half years with, you know, relapse, detox, relapse, detox, until he finally made the decision that it was, it was ruining his life to gain and uh, he needed to stop. That is an incredible journey, Elaine. And I, you know, as I listen to you, what, what strikes me is obviously as a parent, your first concern is for your child. But what was it like for you as his mom processing all the things that you needed to do for him to set him up for success? In other words, you know, we're talking about a time, as you mentioned in 2014, where this was not on people's radar by and large as it is potentially uh, today. Uh, so, you know, what resources were you able to access? How did you formulate this plan? And also, where did you get the courage to say, okay, this is what we're going to do and listen to what he had to say and just find a way to move forward? He was a good kid. <laughs> he really was. And he still is. So, um, you don't turn your back on a good kid. Um, he had goals. Uh, he was he was lost. I just sensed he was lost, and he'd gotten himself, you know, into a position where he had to keep lying and manipulating to maintain uh, the addiction. And I knew he didn't feel good about that. He 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 said when he finally stopped gaming uh, for good, he said, "Now I have to learn how to stop lying because I've just been living a lie for years." And that was important to him uh, to get his integrity back. Um, you know, I really relied on my own um, self-care plan, which I always have done. I continued to play tennis. I continued to do my fitness. I continued to, you know, allow my girlfriends to rally around me as we do in these times. Honestly, my girlfriends saved my life. Um, and I decided... Uh, when I took him back to university after that first relapse, that I just couldn't do this on my own. And so I went to student services with him and we told uh, them uh, the situation. And they actually were enormously help helpful. That was the University of Guelph. They provided him with a counselor, uh, a peer support person, and a special needs advisor because he was reapplying as a student with uh, severe anxiety and depression. Uh, he was allowed to have a special needs advisor. And the, that helped him immensely to have that support at the school level. Um, and I just knew I needed to stay stronger for him because he wasn't strong. So I just dug in and went into autopilot, honestly. Um, I, 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 can't, I can't tell you how I felt the strength. <laughs> I just dug real deep um, and had a lot of support around me as well. Now, video gaming addiction is classified as a disorder by the World Health Organization. Elaine, having lived through everything you've lived through, what do you want parents to know about the seriousness of this disorder, uh, as well as signs and symptoms that they can watch out for to be proactive before this potentially becomes an issue in their household? Yeah, great question, Leanne. I, to me, the most important thing parents can do is listen to their children and listen without judgment. 
uh, one of the common themes that I'm seeing with my gaming uh, addiction families um, is that kids are not feeling heard or seen in the way that they want to be seen and heard. You know, and as parents, we show up with our own expectations and dreams and ideals about our children. And sometimes that mars the way we really see who they are. Um, and so it's really important to bridge that gap. And so part of the prevention is to just really hear your, your kids um, and, and just listen. That's what they need. They, they, they don't always need you to direct them or save them. Uh, they need to learn resilience and they need to feel like they're capable of taking care of themselves uh, down the road. Um, so uh, in terms of how I feel about video gaming addiction overall is that it is a symptom of something emotionally deeper. And if we can not focus so much on the addiction and the problem, but remember that there is a child and a, a spirit behind that addiction that we need to take care of. Um, in terms of signs and symptoms, uh, we look for uh, kids basically deciding that everything else that was important before gaming no longer is important to them. You know, they give up sports and theater and uh, friendships and uh, time spent with family. Uh, we look for um, changes in sleep pattern. Uh, they're far more tired because they're staying up late gaming at night. They're more agitated. Uh, sometimes they're depressed and anxious. Uh, some kids, uh, when you ask them to um, get off of gaming or you try to remove it, um, if they're uh, severely addicted, they can become very violent and volatile. Sometimes they can become very despondent, sometimes suicidal. Uh, so we watch for those kinds of threats. Eating habits change. Are they eating in their room on the console? Um, junk food. You know, some kids are wearing hats with little tubes of you know caffeinated drinks so they can stay up late and stay perky and and energized to play the game. And and they're eating garbage. They're not eating well, or they're not eating at all. In my son's case, he was eating very little, or they're overeating, um, and so they're either gaining too much weight or they're losing too much weight. Um, and are they using gaming when they're upset? So is it a place that they go to uh, to escape or to use as a coping mechanism? Um, changes in school, are their grades slipping? Uh, so those are some of the signs that we look for. Um, and regulate, regulate, regulate. <laughs> Give your kids a balance of other activities outside of gaming. Make sure they're getting exercise. Make sure they're eating healthy. Make sure they have regular sleep habits. Um, no phones, no digital devices at the table. Eat together as a family. Play together as a family. Uh, and keep that communication line open because uh, I think that's the most important thing of all. Now, you've taken this journey that your family has been on uh, and you've turned it into two books and your latest book is called Cyber Sober. Could you share with us, Elaine, um, because it focuses on, on strategies for parents um, you know, who may have a child with gaming addiction. What would you say your top three takeaways for parents from Cyber Sober are? I would say uh, get help. I wouldn't do this alone. I mean, I did it alone, but I mean, I did have some supports and he never did have addiction um, specific therapy. That would be important to have uh, if you need a coach as well for some strategies, whatever you can get in terms of help, talk to your doctor, uh, talk to a counselor, uh, but definitely don't try to do this alone. It is a very long and arduous, frustrating uh task and you'll you're left feeling so helpless so much of the time and it's a it's a real energy drain it's very hard on the rest of the family as well when there are other children in the home uh, so that would say that's the first takeaway is to get help um, to not be so negative about gaming I mean there are a lot of great things about gaming uh, there's a uh, life skills that are translatable from gaming, like um, tenacity and determination, problem solving, team building, micro macro management. Uh, it's, a, it's a great form of uh, family recreation. You can play together. So try to understand um, what it is that your child loves about gaming and take an interest in the game instead of harping on you know games as a negative thing. Uh, that's the thing I hear most commonly. Um, 
And I would say uh, you said three things. I mean, in the book, um, my, I interview my son on four different occasions for the book. And he talks about his own journey and how difficult it was for him to resist the gaming, but also how difficult it was for him to uh, face the pain that he was feeling inside. Um, and so you need to recognize that if your child is addicted, they're in pain emotionally. And so we need to have awareness of that. And they need to have a place to express that uh, that feels safe and non-judgmental for them. You talk about recognizing the signs and symptoms. And in the case of your son, um, you know, in doing the research, you now feel that bullying uh, when he was in middle school could also have been a root cause and a contributing factor. Uh, could you take us through a little bit of that and, and how important that might be for parents to address if their child is being bullied, perhaps is a bully, him or herself? How does, what does that look like uh, in your estimation? Yeah, when we look at addiction uh, using the intent to clinical training, uh, we look at um, three types of addicted gamers. One is the escaper gamer. That's the gamer that you may have suffered some trauma, maybe bullied, maybe on the spectrum, um, struggling socially, uh, may have um, anxiety, depression, ADHD also uh, can be part of that. Um, and they will use gaming to escape. Uh, and it's a coping mechanism for them. And then we look at the high achievers, and these are gamers who may not be getting the feedback they're looking for in life. So may not be hearing from teachers what they need to hear, or their grades are not what they want them to be. Um, you know, feedback at home may not be great or in their social circles. And so they uh, go to gaming to find a sense of uh, quick and easy reward with lower risk um, so they so they can have high achievement and feel a sense of, of uh, high achievement in themselves. And then we have the hardcore gamers, and that's a combination of the two. And they are at the most risk of becoming addicted. And that was my son. He was a hardcore gamer. So, you know, his grades had slipped. He, he didn't like school. School was not a place he enjoyed. It just wasn't conducive to his style of learning. Uh, so it was always a struggle. He's a bright kid. Um, but, you know, he thought he was capable of doing much better than he did. And so gaming gave him that opportunity to, you know, feel that sense of high achievement. He could be the best and, and great at something there and, and hear that from his online peers. And in middle school, uh, he left his school and went to, his, he left grade, uh, the end of grade five and went to a new school, new middle school in a different town uh, because he wanted to go into the gifted program. And so he, he was in a new school and there wasn't very many of his friends from his old school that joined him there. And so he just felt isolated. He didn't feel like he could just get into the inner circle that easy. And then he started to be bullied. And, uh, you know, he told me he was being bullied, but he, and I asked if he wanted help and he said, no, no, I'm handling it fine. And in retrospect, I don't think he was. And I think that's when he probably needed me to intervene the most. Um, so his brother was leaving, who's four years older and they're very close still today. Um, he was leaving on a school exchange to Spain and he was worried about their relationship. And he wanted to stay in touch with his little brother and, and make sure their relationship uh, maintained its closeness. And so he was playing an online multiplayer game and decided that he would introduce his little brother to it so that they could still play this game even though they were thousands of miles apart. And it just so happened that at the same time, uh, my son was being bullied. And so that created a beautiful environment for him to find online friends and be part of a circle where he felt he was accepted as a gamer and uh, as somebody that was good at something. And so it was a great place for him to escape and find a social circle. Uh, and that's when he started giving up, you know, uh, spending time with some of his tangible friends because he'd found all his friends online and they had become his special people. So, you know, obviously this topic is even more timely and relevant as we speak during this pandemic when, you know, all of us have just been exposed to screens uh, basically day and night. What do you want parents to, to really know about um, what they 
just about how serious of an issue this can be and how, you know, not monitoring or not really understanding uh, your child's use of devices, their exposure to screens or having rules and boundaries around that could potentially lead to something like an addiction. Yeah, uh, it's a very worrisome time for many reasons. Um, the online gaming world has increased. The multi-billion dollar industry has increased profits massively during COVID. Um, far more kids are online gaming now and adults as well. Uh, seniors are now spending more time gaming also. Um, child exploitation is increasing now, and, and that happens in gaming as well. Uh, besides, it's not just on social media. Um, uh, in, I just read a statistic yesterday that 2021 was the worst year ever for child exploitation and abuse. Uh, so that's a concern for me. Uh, but also gaming addiction has increased during this time. You know, kids are, they're online and they, they're, they're attending classes technically, but they've got a whole lot of other tabs open and they're sort of paying attention or not paying attention to school. And, you know, they're on other tabs talking to their friends on Discord or uh, they're watching YouTube videos or Netflix or they're playing video games or, or they're doing all of them. They're multitasking. And so I often tell parents, well, I always tell parents, gaming uh, or usage of digital devices should not be behind a bedroom door. It should be in a central location in the home where it can be supervised. And when it is in that central location and supervised, be watching how many tabs are open. Because in my son's case, I would walk into his room to check to see if he was doing his homework. And I realized later he was just flipping over to another tab uh, and making it look like he was working on his homework when, in fact, he was playing a game. Uh, so that's a very worrisome thing that children are um, at home now unmonitored. Um, and I think it's really important for parents more than ever to regulate gaming time during COVID and to make sure kids get outside and get some fresh air and some exercise um, and, you know, have time to read books and, and do art and, and, and play with the family and find other things to do because it's so easy when you're home and you're isolated from your friends to just go online and spend time with them. And, you know, kids are spending, you know, up to 12, 14 hours online and they say well this is this is my social time this is the time to be with my friends but if they weren't online there is absolutely no way we would have our kids out for 12 or 14 hours spending time with their friends i mean i enjoy playing tennis but i don't play for 12 to 14 hours straight mm -hmm. i'd be exhausted mm -hmm. and so we really have to think about you know yeah it's a great social time but there's a time for friends and then there's a time for family and then there's a time to be on your own and there's time for school and there's time for exercise and it's okay to be bored you know boredom is the best time for minds to become creative. Um, and so don't try to fill your kids every bored moment uh, with a digital device. That's excellent advice. Excellent and advice. I think we're, we're all guilty of doing that on some level. I'd like to end on an optimistic note, Elaine. Uh, your son is, is doing well. Uh, he's now 26. Can you tell us what his relationship with technology is like and, and just generally how he's doing today? Yeah, he, thanks so much for asking. Uh, I'm so proud of him. He is uh, four and a half years completely detoxed. He decided to never game again. Uh, I mean, that is an ongoing process. He does have um, a support uh, system and a recovery plan in place. Uh, during COVID, he struggled and wanted to game. So he actually came home for uh, a couple of months and stayed with us because he just didn't trust himself. So that's part of his support system. He knows he can always reach out to us. Um, uh, but he has made the commitment at this point to, to not game. He is, uh, he did get his degree uh, and he is a software developer and uh, has a great job that he absolutely loves. Um, he got himself a little kitten during COVID. And so that's helped a lot. He says, you know, she's a reason for him to get up in the day and, and have purpose and has another little being to look after and helped get him through, through some of the loneliness of COVID. Uh, he's got a lot of great tangible friends that he did make uh, his last couple of years at university. Uh, and so when he can, he spends time with them. Um, he and his brother uh, live in the same neighborhood. Uh, so they're close. Um, 
and uh, yeah, he is very healthy and he, he weighs 185 pounds now <laughs> and smells good. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes he speaks with me. Um, anytime he can help, he will. I mean, he, this is not his thing. He tells me, I'm, this is not my full-time job. Uh, it's yours, mom. Um, but anytime he can speak, he does. And he's always so happy uh, when he can, you know, just help even one other person. That's a wonderful uh, story and a wonderful ending to your story. Elaine Uskowski, a speaker, educator, mother of two, and author of Cyber, Spo S Cyber Sober, A Caregiver's Guide to Video Gaming Addiction. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Leanne. It's beautiful.